Guess what, everyone? I heard that Susan is here on site up at the glass house. That's right. The Susan Barron, who has not been in any of our videos all summer long, and now it's fall. I think it's about time we get her on camera. What do you guys say we go up there and bug her and get her on camera? So Susan, you've not been coming in very much lately. Do you miss Litzinger? And if so, what do you miss about it? Do I miss Litzinger? There's so many things I miss about being here. I miss finding fossils in the creek. I miss the flowers and the bees. I miss warming myself on a sunny log. I miss acorn tops. Doesn't work with a mask on though. <laughs> Not sure. I think I do. I think I miss the hitchhikers. <laughs> I miss the changing of the leaves in the fall. And I miss all of the people. I miss my co-workers and I miss all of you. I hope you're finding ways to get outside in nature and enjoy this fall and I look forward to the time when we can see each other again. Have you ever stopped and thought about all the different birds that we have here at the Ecology Center? How do we go about learning more about the birds? And finding out what birds exactly we have here? Because, I mean, we have such a vital habitat here at Litzinger for them. The prairies, the woodlands, Deer Creek. It's all so important. It provides food, shelter, and refuge for these birds. And some of the birds that you might just normally see here on a regular basis uh, when you come for a visit are definitely not all the birds, right? So what are some of the things that we might even just see on a normal visit? Well, you might stop and see the turkeys as they just kind of walk along on our paths and they stick around all year so that they stand out right really big uh, beautiful bird and then if you're walking through the prairie you might see something like the ruby-throated hummingbirds that migrate through during the year when plants are in bloom uh, nectaring at the flowers if you walk along Deer Creek during the growing season, you're likely to see some of our seasonal visitors like herons or some of the different types of ducks or geese that they're searching for food or a place to raise their young. Or perhaps up by the glass house or the cabin at one of the bird feeders, you may see some of the very common feeder birds that are very common to the St. Louis area. Or if you're walking through one of our prairie paths later on in the season, you're likely to see a very common visitor to the Ecology Center, the goldfinch chowing down on some member of the Aster family's seeds, like the cup plant shown here. Or you may see a little visitor up around the building, searching around for insects to feed its young. Or if you've been keeping your eye on one of our bluebird boxes 
you're likely to see the eastern bluebird or one of the other various visitors to the boxes. But what about those migrants that come through and just temporarily refuel at Litzinger in the spring and the fall? How would you go about tracking these birds? Unless, of course, you had an army of photographers sitting still on the prairie, you know, with a hundred cameras focused on these birds. So if you don't have the capabilities of doing that, how do you go about tracking these birds? Well, if you're like me and you want to know more about this, and I do, I, I want to learn a lot more about these birds that call our place home for even just a short span of time. So if you're like me, let's go talk to our resident bird researcher here at Litzinger, Colleen Crank. Hi, I'm, I'm Linda Tossing. Um, I work at the World Bird Sanctuary as their bird banding coordinator. And I work with uh, Colleen. Uh, she has worked with our banding team uh, since uh, 2001. I guess it's almost 20 years. Um, I started it as um, working with another person and we, uh, she left and I took over the job and I've been doing that ever since. And we have do several different types of programs at the World Bird Sanctuary, but most of our programs are based on the forested area that we have at the site. And what is unique about um, the Litzinger project that Colleen has been managing is that it's a prairie type uh, habitat. And so it's for, very different than what we have. And so it's really interesting to see what she has um, uh, gotten in at the prairie versus what we have at the center. So we've um, we've been working together for almost 20 years. Uh, when we first started at the World Bird Sanctuary, we had one net in between feeders, and we would band out of the back of our car. And so now we have an actual building, and we have um, a migration blitz that we have up to 25 nets and two 30-foot canopy nets. So. We've really expanded our location and, and Colleen has been instrumental in making that happen. So I'm very privileged to help get her started here and then been working with her. So um, I wanted to kind of give you a heads up on what we do at the sanctuary and, and Colleen's involvement in that. So I'm going to pass that baton to her so that she can take it forward for the Listing Bear Project. I first started in the education department as a volunteer. And the first year I was here, I mean, you know, with mist netting, I really kind of had that in mind, the research part of it. And this is an urban area, and I was like, well, what kind of birds are here? What, you know, what's um, here during the summer, what's here during the winter, and the size of the habitat? And so I approached Linda, and I was like, hey, what do you think about mist netting out at Litzinger? And you know, we were talking about the habitat, and so that was back in 2008. And so over the years, it's just I want to keep cataloging the birds and see what's here. And with the half mile long and 85 feet wide at some parts, even wider in others, uh, MSD project that's going through the property, Colleen, uh, how are you looking at that and how that's affecting bird populations here? That is definitely something I'm interested in. So I started doing surveys once a week, um, all, all year long. I'm mist netting in the fall. What I'm interested in knowing is how the noise and the habitat um, disturbance is affecting the birds. Are there bird, birds that are leaving and not coming back? Um, who's staying? And are they breeding here okay? Are they here during the winter okay? Um, I'm just interested in how it's also affecting the migrants with, with the disturbed habitat. Yeah, and I should add that uh in addition to just that habitat disturbance of them coming through, that was actually mostly woodland and we'll have a more open grassland setting following the project. So I would I would think it could greatly affect the uh, type of bird that would be using the site now. Oh, definitely. And that's another question is who's going to come in now that we're going to have, you know, improved habitat and how long will it take them to get here? 
will we get different species? Will the same birds come back? Oh uh, yeah. It'll be really interesting to look at throughout the years. Thanks for doing this, Kelly. Oh yeah, definitely. The little yellow feet. Oh my goodness. Those are so adorable. So when a bird comes up to the table, we have the clips that tell us which net it came from. So like this one is from the prairie net. And the birds come in a bag um, that kind of helps keep them quiet and calm while they're waiting to be processed. Then we refer to our book to see what size band we need. So the book we use to help us identify birds and their ages is this identification guide to North American birds. And the feathers actually tell us a story. They'll tell us how old the bird is with different moat limits. And so there's different illustrations in this book that helps us determine how old the bird is. Um, and though for the birders that are maybe here, there's the flycatcher guide. Um, we've got different flycatchers and they all look the same. So we look at a combination of wing and tail measurements, bill measurements, um, what under the bill looks like. So they, we have to fill out this worksheet to help us determine. No molt. Parasite. And we, we take wing and tail measurements with our ruler. Uh, one twenty nine for wing. Uh, 81 for tail. Wing is 60. Tail is 58. And then with the fly catchers that I talked about earlier, we have to use more precise uh, measurements. And so we use cal the calipers to measure their beak. Oh, and we, afterwards, we do weigh the birds. That's another important factor. So we put them in this bag, a cloth bag, put it on t in the cup, and measure the bird. So the one thing that's interesting are the different size bands that we have for all the birds. We can go from this tiniest one, this is for chickadees and goldfinches, to these really big ones, which are for blue jays and morning doves. And then, so we use pliers to open, this is what they, so that's what it looks like. So it has this post on there to help us open the bands. And then we'll put it in a, put it in a, you know, in one of the appropriate slots.
So Colleen, you've wrapped up for the 2020 Miss Knitting session here in the fall. Uh, so what kind of cool things came out of it? Well, we got a bay breasted warbler. And I'm really excited about that because it's a first for Litzinger. That's a migrant. Um, I was kind of surprised over the number of national warblers we captured, but they like this kind of they like this kind of habitat, a shrubby habitat. First time in the nets were gray catbird, northern flicker, and rose-breasted grosbeak. They are here during the year, but I've, we've never caught them in the nets. And I was a little surprised over the number of indigo buntings we captured that were migrating through. And those are the highlights. Well, now that we've learned a little bit about birds here at Litzinger, why don't we take a little walk around, take a look at some of the fall color, and go talk to Adam about why plants have fall color. So here we have a nice assortment of different trees and shrubs, some of which are displaying different hues of color this time of year. And these colors are caused by different groups of pigments within the leaf cells. So if we look over here, this nice little spice bush, you can see two of those pigment groups on display right now. First one is chlorophyll, which of course is responsible for the green color that most plants have most of the year. Use it for photosynthesis to metabolize sugars and energy for growth.
and it's actively produced throughout the growing season. But later in the year, around this time, when the days are getting shorter and the temperatures start dropping, uh, chlorophyll production slows down, and then it gets to a point where the leaf is actually losing chlorophyll faster than it's being replaced. So then that green color starts to fade and make room for other pigments. And you get colors like yellow and orange, which are caused by a separate pigment group called carotenoids. And they're actually present within the leaf tissues all year round, not just fall. We only see them now because they are no longer being covered up by the chlorophyll. So you can see this one is in the process of losing that green color turning completely yellow. And then some plant species have a third pigment group called anthocyanins, which are responsible for the red and sometimes purple colors you see in leaves. So not all plants have these pigments. Uh, only a small percentage of worldwide temperate plant species produce anthocyanin. Some areas, like the northeastern U.S., have a higher concentration of these species in their natural landscape. So there's more reddish color in their natural woodlands and forests, which makes them popular tourist destinations for leaf peeping in the fall. And these are different from the other two pigments in that these are not produced year-round. These pigments only show up uh, starting in late summer into fall. And these are dependent on two main factors. First one is uh, the phosphate levels within the leaves. So in the height of the growing season when most of these leaves are still green, the levels of phosphate within the leaf tissues are fairly high. But later in the year when things start slowing down, the phosphate level drops. And that actually changes the way the leaf cells metabolize sugars and causes them to start producing these anthocyanin pigments. The other factor is uh, sunlight exposure. So a tree like this dogwood that's growing in almost full sun is going to have a better and more intense red color than if it were in the understory. So bright, brighter sunlight causes more red color. And then another color you're going to see is brown, which is not really caused by any pigments since these leaves are pretty much dead and no longer metabolizing. So the brown color you're seeing is just the uh, leftover cell walls in the leaf tissues. So yeah, it's a nice time of year to start getting out and looking at some foliage before it all falls off. And since we don't currently have any kids out playing in the leaves, we decided to have us, the restoration team, out playing in the leaves instead for you. Actually, I don't miss the hitchhikers. James, why do you make me do these things? <laughs>